Okay, so we just wanted to um, close this um, meeting with um, um, a brief summary of what we took away from the meeting. Where are we? Um, where are we going? Um, and we've divided up the topics uh, amongst the four of us, so each of us will talk about five minutes, <laughs> I guess. Um, and um, um, I will start with the microbiology aspects of the meeting. So I think uh, what I took away from it, some of the consensus points is that um, I th we all, I think, agree that it's better to talk about an optimal vaginal microbiota and not a normal uh, vaginal microbiota, and that optimal basically uh, means Lactobacillus crispatus uh, dominated. Um, I think we, are, we haven't really reached consensus yet about Lactobacillus inars. It's either a friend or a foe. It's, um, I think the consensus was that sometimes it's a friend and sometimes it's a foe. Um, we heard that diversity which many people use in their analyses is, uh, um, is not always a good measure to use. So, you know, keep that in mind that actually some types of dysbiosis are low diverse. For example, uh, Gardnerella vaginalis domination. Um, we heard a very interesting talk by Jacques uh, Ravel um, about his work trying to expand uh, the community state types that he designed many years ago. Um, these community state types are very uh, useful. Um, but uh, we also uh, heard that it's important that that work includes women uh, worldwide, which I think he's planning on doing. Um, we also talked a lot about Garnerella vaginalis and um, you know, the importance of keeping in mind that there are many different clades or strains or whatever we call them uh, of Garnerella vaginalis and I think a lot more work needs to be done to characterize them better. Um, we also talked about the need for um, perhaps categorizing the vaginal microbiota, uh, not just uh, bioinformatically in community state types in some of our analyses, but when you have specific research questions that um, for which pathogenicity is important, then you might want to bring pathogenicity into the mix, uh, which we have tried to do um, in, in our probiotic trial where we actually created our own bacterial groups that did take pathogenicity into um, account. Um, and also, I think, uh, similarly, we heard some caution about using uh, relative abundance data, um, and it might, in many cases, be very useful to actually quantify. Um, we had a very interesting talk from uh, Dave Fredericks um, about uh, development of uh, BV. Um, I think that was, from, for many of us, was uh, eye-opening and, and very interesting, um, where he saw that um, uh, BV-associated bacteria started to increase before the lactobacilli started to decrease, and this, this decrease was mostly uh, Lactobacillus crispatus, Jansenii, but not Lactobacillus inars. We heard an interesting talk from Caroline uh, Mitchell about the upper genital tract, where there clearly is a gradient with many bacteria in the vagina, fewer bacteria in the cervix, and uh, there are bacteria in the upper genital tract, but not uh, as many. And um, some bacteria seem to be good ascenders and others aren't. That was very interesting, and we also heard a few interesting talks about the penile microbiota. Um, I think eventually, in terms of next steps, um, I think it's important that we start moving to clinically relevant um, community state types, if you will, um, because those would inform uh, diagnostics, interventions, uh, prevention strategies. Um, but until we get there, because at the moment I think we might not yet know exactly how to do that, um, until we get there I think it's very important that we all continue to use very precise language, always explain exactly what you did, so don't use uh, the term BV without actually explaining how you defined it, or even a term like dysbiosis or domination. What, what exactly do you mean when you say domination? Um, I think we still need to do a lot of work on biofilms. We had some very interesting talks by Hans Vostrale and uh, Tanya Kusiti and others, um, but we clearly, uh, this is definitely a, a gap. We, re we need a lot more work in that area. Um, and um, we also need uh, more work on figuring out where the BV-associated bacteria uh, that start to increase when women develop BV, where do they come from? Do they come from pieces of biofilm that are left behind or from reservoirs um, or from sexual partners? I think there are many possibilities and we need more work on this. And with that, I will...
um, hand the microphone to Doug. Great, thank you. Um, I've been given the task of talking about uh, microbial associations, the HIV risk, um, and I'm going to apologize in advance for uh, not being able to mention a number of wonderful talks that were given during um, the workshop. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, obviously there is growing consensus that specific bacterial communities do impact HIV acquisition risk, and I think the, you know, what's been happening now is having greater precision about the uh, microbial and host contributions to that risk. Um, I think starting with, as Yannicka mentioned, just having better de definitions of the communities and um, Jacques talk about CST structures and, and thinking about how do we kind of unify nomenclature there. Um, also, David Fredericks um, 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 bringing up considerations about quantitative measures relative to, uh, versus re uh, relative measures of microbial community abundance. Um, I think that also there is now we're going from just bacterial taxa to species and now to understanding the uh, potential importance of subspecies and strain level characterization of these communities and looking more specifically at the genomic content of these communities and figuring out what the actual mechanism by which this risk is mediated. Um, there is, I think, really interesting work presented by Jacques, but also Matt Hayward and um, Greg Buck about looking at um, specific strains um, and the pan genomes that are present there. Um, and then also, I think in specific functions, um, Nikki Klatt's work, which many of us know about uh, the potential role of uh, specific microbes in um, PrEP efficacy and uh, tenofovir and depivirine potentially um, degradation. Um, and then I think also not just with HIV, but also the potential role of microbial communities related to STI risk. Um, um, and so we had a number of really great short talks, which um, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to sort of summarize in whole. Um, but in addition to, I think, the microbial contributions, thinking about the host contributions and getting more definition there about um, mechanisms as well, um, you know, Lindy Masson and Sujatha both gave really wonderful presentations looking at proteomics um, and trying to figure out what are the more precise definitions of the, the types of inflammation that are being induced by these microbial communities associated with risk. Um, and then, of course, um, Joanne is going to talk about a lot of related talks related to host immunology and um, vaginal microbial communities that also pertain to HIV. Um, and then, of course, um, lest we forget, um, Tom reminded us about the importance of mucus at the general track and its potential role in HIV risk. Uh, so overall, I think there's been a lot of um, great progress, um, but still, obviously, much left to be done. Uh, I just kind of want to make a comment about um, an overall uh, thought that I had about this uh, meeting, which is just that it really feels like a community to me here, and it feels like a really knowable community, and I hope that um, you've gotten to know one another and that, that you'll leave this meal meeting feeling like this community is actually smaller um, and that you have made a lot of connections. Um, and I also want to just say that I'm going to be really uh, leaving this meeting feeling very inspired by the work that um, all of you are doing and um, very optimistic about uh, the future and about um, the contributions that we'll make and hopefully we'll really be able to solve many of these problems that we've discussed um, in the coming years. So with that, I'll pass over to you, Jeannie. Well, it's hard to top that for eloquence and sincerity, Doug. So that was just beautifully said. And I, I think I said the first day that part of what was really exciting about this meeting was not only seeing so many wonderful long-term friends and colleagues, but also seeing so many young people, particularly from Africa um, and other uh, countries outside the U.S. So I hope you're right. I think you're right. Um, I hope that we can all stay in touch and remember that we really are stronger when we can replicate our results um, in other labs, in other countries, in other populations. So um, I think it's a really probably the best thing about this meeting. I, I also think we'll probably do it again, maybe not next year, but maybe 2020. So be thinking about what kinds of things we um, missed here. So I think that Yannicka asked me to talk a little bit about treatment. You did a beautiful job really giving an overview. The only thing I'll say very quickly is that, um, you know, with regard to treatment, first of all, I think we need to think, as Jen Balkus very eloquently pointed out this morning, what are we trying to do with treatment, right? Treatment to this state or to this point has been really 
um, aimed at treating an epiphenomenon of whatever the heck is causing BV. We really don't know what it is. And the epiphenomenon, of course, is the uh, proliferation of anaerobes um, and the loss of lactocrispatus. So um, it's, it's still in a very frustrating place for me, um, and, and, and that relates to the, I think, relatively scant pipeline um, that we have alluded to. Really, when you look at the quote-unquote advances that have been made in treatment, they have been modification of old drugs, new formulations of old drugs, or they have been uh, new methodologies that are, again, providing ancillary uh, approaches to, uh, to improving the environment. So hormones, I think some of the most exciting, encouraging data we saw were from the Rwanda study that Tanya uh, Kuchidi presented. Uh, that's, I think, very hopeful, and I think that relates a lot to what Dr. Hillier presented about uh, the bleeding patterns. Can we start thinking about manipulating that environment? particularly when you're thinking about combining those products to address women's desperate urge to protect themselves from unintended pregnancy with HIV or STI uh, protective measures. So that's pretty exciting. The biofilm disruptors, I think, are promising, but they point out a really important piece, which is we have no new products that we're looking at in pregnant women. And if you look again at where morbidity and mortality related to these bacteria are worldwide, preterm delivery, low birth weight, that's really what we need to think about. So to me, that's a very big, a very big area to focus on next time. I guess the last thing I want to return to is, um, and, and then of course the partner treatment piece, which was beautifully covered by, by Kat Bradshaw today, and I think really got into all the subtleties and areas we need to understand there. Um, the last thing I just want to circle back to is again, Jen's point this morning, thinking about what are we trying to treat? And is it time to think about defining a new outcome in intervention studies that is not clinical AMSL criteria, not gram stain, but maybe meaningful shifts to the kind of community states that we really want to either measure it as a molecular modality, whether it's a qPCR, whether it's compot measure, but really how do we shift to what I think we all agree is a lactobacillus crispatus predominant environment. That, I think, again, getting back to my probably my first slide of the consensus statement. So that's uh, where I'll leave you and pass it to Joanne. Um, so I've been tasked with talking about um, genital tract immunology as it relates to the microbiome. And um, the session started on Thursday with um, looking at, um, there were a couple of talks, including myself um, and Jordan Kiongo talking about biomarkers of inflammation and how this relates to HIV risk. And I think we're getting to the point now where we're starting to see the same candidates uh, markers coming up that are telling us the same thing, and we should probably pay a little bit of attention to that um, with upregulation of some of the inflammatory cytokines and RP10 standing out as sort of being something that we need to understand in a lot more detail. Um, I'm skipping over a lot of really great talks in that session, um, but just to go to Seth Bloom and Doug Kwan's talk on how this relates to cellular immunity and um, particularly the relationship or the, um, the balance between TH17 cells, which we now appreciate are really susceptible to HIV infection um, and are very um, prevalent in the female genital tract. And the balance between those cells um, um, interacting with the microbiome and... Um, T regulatory cells, um, and in the presence of in, um, dysbiotic organisms, you're getting the sort of um, enhancement of, well, the hypothesis was enhancement of TH17 cells, but there des definitely does seem to be some kind of disruption in the TH17 to T reg ratio, um, which was really interesting and important um, data that emerged. Um, I think one of the um, sort of the most exciting talks in a way was um, from Melissa Herps um, Krelovitz, who was looking at models. So a lot, of the, um, a lot of the immunology studies are limited by access to the samples that we can take ethically um, without causing a lot of damage. And um, Doug, myself, Jordan, all talked about um, lavages, soft caps, and cyta brushes as being sort of direct ex vivo, evaluation of um, cellular immunity from the cervix. But there's a real need for studying the architecture of the lower female genital tract. And what we've been looking at so far are very superficial cells. 
um, and their relevance, they, they've taught us a lot. But I think if we're going to move forward with um, biofilms and how the microbes interact with these epithelial surfaces, the 3D model systems um, that Melissa was describing, I think are essential. Um, and I think this is an opportunity, um, but it's also one of the challenges because I think one thing we all acknowledge is that there's really no good animal model for studying um, bacterial vaginosis, and um, and that's going to be a sort of a major obstacle. And and choosing the model system, the host model system you use, depending on the um, the question you have in mind, um, and then sort of just to overlap a little bit with what. Um, Doug mentioned um, that Tom gave a really great presentation to remind us about mucus. And although it's not an um, immune um, sub substance, it is really important this interaction with antibody responses and how antibodies um, interacting with mucus can actually change properties of mucus that could influence the response to bacterial vaginosis. And in that in particular, that talk um, struck me as being really an important thing that we could um, get a lot more information into. Um, David McIntyre gave a brilliant talk um, in the context of pregnancy and onset of labor and the role of inflammatory cascades in, in that context. And I think we can learn a lot. So um, sort of the people that are working on HIV um, don't think too much about pregnancy, but the very thing that starts um, preterm labor or labor is an inflammatory cascade that involves a lot of the cytokines we're measuring, and we just need to keep talking to each other and reading each other's papers, because I think there's a lot of commonalities there. Um, and the final opportunity, I think, um, that we didn't really touch on at all, is um, we focused a lot on how to treat BV, um, which is very recurrent and very prevalent and difficult to deal with, but we really didn't discuss, or a couple of questions came up, on how we could um, manage inflammation better and whether the only way to manage inflammation is by managing the dysbiosis or whether there are more direct methods of managing host inflammation by anti-inflammatory modalities. And I'm not sure where that, that, what that looks like, but maybe in two years' time it would be good to um, bring in some experts on that side. So I hand back to you. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure working with you this last year to put this meeting together. I think it was a very privilege to, to have been invited to do so. It's been an excellent meeting. Thanks to all of you for attending this meeting. Um, I got to know a lot of new people, and I, um, it's been great to have all of the people that I've looked up to for years <laughs> in the same room uh, for several days, and, and lots of interactions, lots of discussions. Um, so safe travels home, um, hopefully tomorrow, because tonight we will still have a party. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>